together of Andrew Swyscud with Kendall Robinson and Holy Matrimony. 
This is not only a celebration, but this is a worship service today. Because when two Christians become married, they're giving testimony to the goodness and grace of God in their lives. We gather here today to bear witness to the fact that God has done a wonderful and beautiful thing and a great work in bringing Andrew and Kendall together today. So as we begin today, let's pray, thanking God for this day and asking for his blessing on their marriage. Father, we thank you for the gift of marriage and for the blessing of family and friends. We acknowledge today your goodness, your kindness, and your grace in giving us the gift of marriage as a picture of your gospel. We pray that today you would be glorified and King Jesus would be magnified as we celebrate the joining together of two of your children, Andrew and Kendall. We ask that you bless their marriage, Father, and you remind us of your goodness and your faithfulness as we witness this sacred event today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Who gives this woman to wed this man? Her mother. You may be seated. Well, Andrew, Kendall, you made it. <laughs> after months of counting down the days, running errand after errand after errand, and the countless other tasks and details that have led us up to this moment, here we are. This is a day that both of you have eagerly looked forward to, and I want to urge you right now to breathe and <laughs> soak up every minute of this. Remember this day as you move forward. It's been a tremendous joy and honor for Kathleen and I to walk alongside you in preparation for this special day. The love that you two have for each other, and I say this with complete sincerity, is only overshadowed by the love that you have for your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that has been a tremendous and beautiful encouragement for myself, and I'm sure for the others that are in your presence today. And today, as we celebrate your union as husband and wife, we see a beautiful picture of the gospel and the union between Christ and his bride, the church. As you both know, God takes marriage very seriously. We've talked about that in numerous marriage counseling sessions by now. And despite what our ever-changing culture demands about marriage, we can have the utmost confidence and assurance that marriage was created by God, not by man, not by government institutions, but by God himself. And he did this. He created marriage for one purpose, and that's to give us a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, marriage is a major theme throughout the Bible. The Bible begins and ends with a marriage ceremony. And the first wedding occurs in Genesis with the marriage of Adam to Eve. And in that first wedding, God himself gives away the first bride. And the final wedding we see in Scripture occurs in Revelations 19 with the marriage of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, to all of the saints throughout history. And so every wedding that has taken place since that first one and leading up to the final one serves for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to point us to the reality found in Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. In Ephesians 5, 22 through 32, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. In this passage from Ephesians, Paul tells us that your marriage is a picture of Christ's love for his bride, the church. That should blow us away to hear. God created marriage explicitly so that we might better understand the gospel and the relationship of Christ to his bride, the church. Your marriage is not 
primarily about happiness. Your marriage is not primarily about enjoyment. It is about a living out of a tangible expression of the gospel that you both believe in. Your marriage is about God's glory. In this way, your marriage is built on a love story much greater than your own. It's built on the love story of Christ and his bride, the church. And that story is this, that there is one God, and he created everything that we see today. And the pinnacle of his creation was Adam and Eve. Mankind created in his image with worth, dignity, and purpose. He created them, and he has created us so that we might worship him and know him personally. Yet just like Adam and Eve, we have chosen to rebel and we have sinned against an almighty God. The perfect union and relationship that Adam and Eve first had with each other and with God Almighty, with no sin or shame or guilt, it has been fractured. We have been separated from God because of our own sin and rebellion. And whether knowingly or not, we sit deservingly under his wrath to come. But, praise God, the story does not end there. God did not leave Adam and Eve, and he does not leave us. He pursues us. Rather than leave his creation to be separated from himself, God humbled himself and stepped out of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, for one purpose and one purpose alone, to die on the cross, paying the penalty each and every one of us owes for sinning against him. He lived the sinless life that we could not, so that he could die the horrible death that we deserve. He took our place on the cross so that the penalty of sin could be paid and that we might be reconciled back to him. And three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death and sin once for all for those that believe and place their faith in him. And in Romans 8, 1, the Apostle Paul tells us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The guilt, the shame, and the condemnation that we deserve are no more for those that confess Jesus as Lord. So Jesus stepped into human history to pursue his bride, believers throughout the ages, and he gave everything for us. He not only pursued us, but he did what we could not do. He lived the perfect life that we could not and died the death that we deserve. God passionately, relentlessly pursues us with a love that far surpasses anything we can feel for one another. That is what your marriage ceremony today and your marriage throughout your life is to point us towards. When Paul says this mystery is profound, what he is saying is that this marriage we are witnessing today is a picture of the gospel and God's great love for his people. Andrew and Kendall, the two of you stand here today giving great evidence of your faith in Christ Jesus as your Savior, and it is with this in mind that I want to give you the following charge. If you'll please turn to face each other and respond accordingly. Andrew, will you love Kendall as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? And will you live to serve your bride just as Christ came to serve his, the church? I will. Kendall, will you submit to Andrew as the church is to submit to Christ? And will you live to serve your husband humbly in love. I will. Andrew and Kendall, will you strive in the power of the Holy Spirit to let your marriage be a picture of the sacrificial love of Christ and the power of the gospel? We will. Andrew, repeat after me. I, Andrew, take you, Kendall. I, Andrew, take you, Kendall. To be my wedded wife. Be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. Until death do us part. Until death do us part. Following Christ's example. Following Christ's example. I will lead you humbly. I will lead you humbly. Love you sacrificially. Love you sacrificially. And serve you joyfully. And serve you joyfully. Andrew, do you have a ring as a symbol of your love and commitment to Kindle? I do. Andrew, place the ring on Kendall's finger and repeat after me, please. I give you this ring as a symbol of love. I give you this ring as a symbol of love. 
I will honor you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will honor you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Kindle, repeat after me. I, Kindle, take you, Andrew. I, Kindle, take you, Andrew. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. Until death do us part. Until death do us part. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go. And your people shall be my people. And your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. And your God, my God. Kendall, do you have a ring as a symbol of your love and commitment to Andrew? I do. Kendall, please place this ring on Andrew's finger and repeat after me. I give you this ring as a symbol of love. I give you this ring as a symbol of love. I will honor you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I will honor you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Kendall and Andrew have chosen to partake of the Lord's Supper as their first act as husband and wife. If you would at this time silently pray for them, lift them up to our Father in prayer. thank you for pursuing and loving us when we were your enemy. We thank you for the gift of marriage and pointing us to the gospel through it. Father, we pray that you would bless Andrew and Kendall, that you would draw them not only to each other, but to yourself. Father, I ask that you would empower them through your Holy Spirit to serve each other in love and humility. God, help them to be quick to forgive each other just as you are quick to forgive us. I pray that you would be glorified through their marriage and that they would make much of you for all of their days. Amen. Andrew, Kendall, I want to leave you with this following blessing, and this is a blessing that Moses prayed for the Israelites in Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Andrew and Kendall, by the authority given to me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus and in accordance of God and the law of the great state of Georgia, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Andrew, you may kiss your bride. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to announce for the first time anywhere Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Swicegood. Yeah.